Uh, let me introduce also Borja, uh, Borja Iriarte, you're this, uh, um, excuse me, uh, first of all, Jesus, Jesus de la Fuente is the chess executive officer of Grafenea. It's a well, very well-known company here in, in the Basque Country. Okay. And also we have here uh, Borja. Borja, uh, he's huge uh, here in the Basque Country. He has been a lawyer for many years in one of the big, big, one of the big four accounting firms. And uh, Borja will initiate uh, the, the debate. Thank you. When you want, Borja. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pablo. Uh, first, uh, we have noticed uh, this morning that we walk together in Today, is, I think that today said Iguay, not, not Arsanjan in, in our ancient times. It was Arsanjan, but now it's yes. Iguay, I think. You were oh. in Bilbao, I was yeah, in, in, in Madrid. In Madrid, but we were in the same group working. Okay, uh, then now to begin. First, uh, I want to thank Global Lands Institute and Professor Alvarez, who invited me the, being called to participate in this training session. Uh, it's for me a pleasure and an honor being with people of such relevance as Professor Pokar or our prior speaker uh, and having the, the opportunity to, be, to speak uh, with them, to share the, the panel with them. And second, I want to beg your pardon. I know that I have, this is my first public speak in English, and I know that I have an awful Spanish accent. Uh, uh, staying in London twice, uh, I, I make questions in English and I, and I was directly answered in Spanish. <laughs> and you can bet that this is quite mortifying. <laughs> so I beg your pardon. Uh, uh, I, I will try to do my best. Uh, additionally, I, say I've, I have been given 20 minutes to speak in English. Okay, I, usually I don't like to read, but in, but in English I will... I will have to read something of my, uh, or I have to speak uh, about 20 minutes in more on a, on a, on a philosophical than on a legal question. And I said I will try to do my best. Wait the question, why I'm going to speak about practical difficulties in access to courts, the, re the right to due process versus arbitration. First, uh, human rights and private law is not a common issue. We usually, when we think of human rights, we think in public law, uh, in constitutional law, in law, uh, law, in the fight between the state, the powerful, uh, and the weak people, the individuals. But we usually don't speak of human rights when companies are involved, or individuals are involved interacting individuals and companies. But I not, I am not sure if this is true. Uh, I don't. I am not sure that uh, uh, human rights is only a question related to public bodies. Uh, I think that uh, some questions are also related to private interaction, the interaction of private of private, private people. Uh, where, for instance, we all agree that an administrative action forcing people to go to arbitration instead of to courts uh, or, or imposing uh, exotic, uh, submission to exotic, to exotic courts should be overridden by courts. But this is not uh, clear in um, private relations, only with consumers. We know that uh, that kind of uh, clauses in, imposed to consumers are banned by Regulation 44 2001, or now really 1215 uh, 2012, no? or the law 1 uh, 2007 of uh, protection of consumers. But what happens when um, at corporate level? Uh, uh, usually, people try to say that all companies are equal, no? Uh, but uh, I don't. See, I don't. I am not completely sure if all of them are, are equal or one, some of them are more equal than others, no? Uh, what happens? Uh, what does it happen when a big company, a great client, imposes a, a small supplier an arbitration clause in a contract? Uh, for instance, submit, with submission to Paris Court, a CCI arbitration, uh, you have to sign your contract if you want to sell. 
probably this uh, we can speak later about that. And they say, okay, no problem. Uh, we buy the, the price is this, uh, the amount of the, uh, to be bought is this. But any dispute regarding this contract will be subject to arbitration before the Paris court, for instance. Uh, is that equitable, for instance, in a 50,000 uh, euros contract? Or is it a way to avoid uh, court's control? Uh, the right to a due process established by the Spanish constitution about, uh, and by major treaties on, on human rights. Uh, we know that uh, an arbit in international arbitration is a complex and expensive matter. So and sometimes uh, it's a way to avoid in co control by courts. Because uh, if you have to claim 10,000 euros, for instance, uh, probably it's more affordable losing the amount than beginning a, a, a crime before the, the an, international, an international and foreign uh, arbitration court. And to speak uh, about that, I will make, uh, okay, I, I like sports and I like uh, sport law, no? So I will use an example that is the court of, for arbitra uh, of arbitration for sports, commonly no known of TAS. Uh, because it's the most common. Because we, we shall see, uh, but first, okay, first, why? Because I think that uh, sports is funny. A uh, lot of people like sport or is interested in sport. In some sense, uh, sport is the opium of the opiate of the people of the 21st century. And I think that is, uh, and it's a very important, relevant economic matter, no? Uh, so I think that will be a, a, good, uh, a good example for our question. Uh, we usually think that sport, elite sportmen are rich, but this is not true. Eh? Elite sportmen uh, or sportwomen, uh, to be politically correct, uh, are a complex group, group of people which includes several differences, differences inside. Uh, many of them are not, uh, many of the people, okay, really most of the people that go, for instance, to Olympic Games are not rich people. Some of them have several, several problems. To, to go to, the, to obtain the money to go to the, to the Olympic Games, no? And all of them, for instance, have mandatorily to submit to any question relating to the Olympic Games before an uh, arbitration court in Lausanne, Switzerland, the famous uh, court of, for, of arbitration for sports. For many of them, an international arbitration procedure, expensive and complex, is almost impossible to follow. I will explain later an example when they decided not to sue the relevant federation and don't go to the World Championship. Uh, and why this? Uh, I, I use this uh, example also because I think that uh, sport arbitration is a good example uh, of the kind of people you find in international big businesses. Sports people or sports managers uh, usually are above law. We have seen in Spain that uh, just three days ago, the president of the Football Federation, I can see it publicly because he has said in public, has said that he's not worried about the law to be implemented in Spain because he's not subject to law. No, according and really, uh, uh, Article 78 of FIFA of FIFA 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 statutes uh, uh, says that uh, FIFA its members and the confederations are the original owners of all the rights emanating from competitions, with, uh, without any restrictions as to content, time, place, and law. They express, expressly said that they will not uh, that they are not subject to law. Uh, also, uh, there is an interesting document, the International Committee, uh, Olympic Committee sent uh, a document to the European Union during the last French presidency asking, asking for, a, I say literally, a special and adequate to a sport interpretation of EU, AU treaties. So they said, please let us alone. We are not going to apply. They had one problem with the famous Bosman case, I suppose that you all know, uh, when the European Court had to expressly say that, that professional sportsmen are workers subject to freedom, to, to community freedom. And after that, they wanted to explain 
to escape for that, and they wanted to, they, to have their own courts. Uh, and, I, and I make one question. Is it reasonable to look for justice from a body that expressly says that law is now not a matter for them? Eh? The International Federation is not a treaty, an international treaty. It's just a Swiss association, private association. But they say that they are above law. And if you want to go to some relevant sport competitions, you have to, sub to sign a submission clause to a court that is not owned, but is related, in the past was directly owned, the court by the Olympic uh, Committee, now is related, uh, very, very, very related, but they are independent uh, bodies uh, that uh, they say that they are not subject to law. That's the, uh, that's the, the question, that, that is why I think that this is a good example, no? Uh, because they say that the court was just established to avoid problem with courts, with general courts. The court is uh, located at La Lausanne in Switzerland uh, and has jurisdiction in major sports question. For instance, penalties related to major international leagues, uh, doping, sportmen labor contracts, that I think that is against our public order, at least in Spain, but uh, uh, theoretically, any sportsman, elite sportsman that has a labor problem with his team has to claim before the, the, Europe, the court international. I think that this is clearly against our, our public order and will be overrun, would be overrun by Spanish courts, but you have a contract signed saying that. Yeah. And what can you do? Which is the, this is a Swiss, uh, as I said, as a Swiss arbitration to arbitration court. No? Their awards, that's, that's one of, I've said the translator, I beg them pardon because I'm going to make a, 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 a game of words, uh, complex to, trans to translate, no? the word for that results from arbitration is an award. I, and it reminds me the Academy Awards. No? The, and it's something related, no? because when you receive a, a judgment or an award, the first thing that you read is who is the winner. No? <laughs> so, <laughs> So you say, and the winner is the winner is them, no? So the awards are subject to uh, to to a, re a review by the federal court of Switzerland, with a limited scope of uh, review, similar to Article 41 for arbitration law. Uh, and we will speak. Uh, so you have to go to Switzerland for arbitration. If you don't uh, agree with the award you have to sue it the, to challenge it before a Swiss court, more money. Swiss court will probably, um, uh, Swiss court does not overread many awards from the court for sports uh, because they, as everyone, not only they, uh, take care of their own businesses and the court and the sports movement is a big business for Switzerland. And they have something good that if the federal court decided to hit them once and another and twice and three times, they took the private association, moved it to another country where um, it should be better welcomed. No? So it's complex dealing with them. These awards are fully executable in Spain as any other. Eh? Uh, should be executed by first instance court with recognition in some case by the civil and criminal bench of the regional court, where I am actually serving. Uh, probably labor-related labor uh, questions uh, will not be executed in Spain, because it should be against our, our public policy, uh, but there are no judgments, at least in Spain at this moment. In Germany, there has been recently a case uh, one federation imposed a sanction over do, doping, uh, over dopate, I think is the word in English, no? Doping uh, to a sportsman. The sportsman challenged it before the court of, for, of arbitration. The court sustained the, 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 the penalty and he claimed again before the German courts. And as I have read in the specialist, specialized papers, a German court has denied the lack of jurisdiction and has 
uh, accepted the claim. I don't know which will be the final, the final consequence, but at least they consider that similar to Spain, that uh, mm, uh, doping is a question related to administrative or criminal law and is not subject to arbitration. Uh, one of the problems, okay, I, want, no, I don't want to go to other questions, but one of the problems with this kind and any arbitration is that arbitration law is more, more Anglo-Saxon law than uh, continental law. Uh, we see that in arbitration, in sport law, in many other questions, in probably all the 21st century lex mercatoria is more Anglo-Saxon law than uh, continental law, and that will have problems for us, no? because sometimes we have uh, questions in contracts that are not uh, disposable for the parties, uh, uh, we, and that kind of things. Uh, and what is, uh, okay, so that is an introduction to the court. And my question is, uh, are dispute, disputes with federations or with the International Big Committee balanced? Uh, can, for instance, a Bowman, uh, typical sport with not too much money, uh, sue his federation in Switzerland if the federation denies the possibility to go to World Championship? Only, I think that only is possible if he's wealthy by, by his own, but not from the money received from, from sports. Uh, the other option that he has is uh, a claim before Spanish courts looking for abrogation of the arbitration clause. First, he has to obtain from the Spanish court admission of uh, jurisdiction, because obviously the first uh, position of the other party will be lack of jurisdiction due to arbitration court. Uh, he will have to convince the judge that uh, the clause is at least in the first moment uh, against the, his rights. I think that is a very complex question. And even winning and obtaining a favorable judgment in Spain, uh, export, uh, export entities uh, would probably never execute the judgment. Uh, as, as I said, they are over courts and law, so it should be, I don't know how to, to execute uh, that kind of sentence, uh, okay, by means of a, uh, crime of uh, disobedience, I don't know the word, and if the president of the uh, federation <laughs> wants to come to Spain, the international federation comes to Spain and is arrested by police, something like that, I think that's the only way, because they voluntarily will never fulfill the question. Yeah, and then that, what I said is a real case, one federation in the, Basque, uh, the Spanish, but a uh, Basque-related sportman, in a minority, minority sportman, impose a, a penalty to a sportman. Uh, he has been world champion uh, that uh, composed of uh, a penalty, a monetary penalty, and he was not allowed to go to the next, uh, to the next world championship. Uh, he uh, sued uh, the federation before Spanish courts for the penalty and won the procedure and have a favorable judgment, but obviously he didn't challenge before the court of, for arbitration in Lausanne the other penalty, so he couldn't go to the World Championship, and he was he could, he might have been for the second time consecutively World Champion, but he couldn't. That's one of the consequences that you can have when you've signed um, uh, an arbitration clause. And sometimes you don't, you are not, uh, you are you don't you don't have any other option if you go want to participate in war in the sport World Championship or in a sport uh, in, or in Olympic Games, you have to sign that kind of clause. You have to sign a contract of maybe 20 pages, probably Juanjo has, has, that has been related to sports law, has a, an example, no? About 20 pages, uh, and you have to, to quit many questions. Uh, you, you transfer your image, uh, your image rights, I don't know if I trans have I transferred my ones to governance to the streaming. I'm not completely sure, but I will have to check that. Uh, and you, you uh, renounce to, <laughs> <laughs> and you renounce to any claim before any court in the world regarding the championship. And what can we do to solve this? Uh, uh, first, uh, I, will, I, will, I will speak briefly regarding arbitration and the difference with procedure before courts. 
and when two major difference that we and we will speak later speak later that show that the uh, arbitration is not there are three difference I think major that it's not similar to to court's procedure. Okay, I know that now I am a judge and judges try to mistrust in arbitration. So I will say the bad parties of arbitration. Also, usually arbitration is quicker than ordinary justice, at least, at least in Spain. I don't know in other countries, I don't know in Italy or in Portugal, we can speak <coughs> later, probably on the, or in the States. No, it depends on the state, on the federal level, on that kind of issues. So, but I know that is more expeditive, but it has some difference. No? As I said, uh, uh, first of all, uh, Article 170.3 of the Constitution says that the exercise of, ju of judicial authority uh, in any kind, both passing judgment and having them executed, lies ex exclusively within the competence of the courts and tribunals established by law. Okay, Constitutional Court uh, has said that arbitration is not against the Constitution. Don't worry about that. Uh, it has, the question was raised, no? Because if the Constitution says that only uh, uh, law established courts are, uh, can uh, judge or and execute, uh, is possible arbitration in Spain? Okay, so the Constitutional Court said yes, provided that it fulfills the principle of equality, adversarial procedure, and audi alter in partem. I've taken from a translator. And the Constitutional Court in Spain never uses Latin, but uh, Anglo-Saxon lawyers love Latin and consequently continues with that, that kind of expression. If, this, if these three principles are not fulfilled, the arbitration should be uh, against constitution. The reality is that, at least formally, always are fulfilled these three principles. Uh, when we speak later about uh, procedures against awards, I will say that uh, almost never an award is overruled by Spanish courts. Uh, but, uh, because, and that kind of principles are checked. No? The first difference, uh, significant, is that the arbitrator cannot execute the award, can pass, can pass, pass judgments sharing, in a sharing competence with courts, but he cannot execute the awards. Execu execution, at least in Spain, always released in the courts. Uh, and this is a very significant difference, as the winner arbitration will need the court help to execute and sometimes execution of awards is not an easy question in Spain. It is made by first instance courts. Uh, in Madrid is the 101, it sounds a great number. The 100 first time deals with arbitration and I've been said that for instance, uh, they always uh, ask for the agreement, arbitration agreement, or the arbitration clause, or for the Spanish law says that the clause can be an exchange of mails or that, or that kind of documents. Uh, the ones, the court said, they showed them as clause one mail stating uh, we, we, uh, we propose to submit before ex arbitration court that's con that controversy. The other part answered the mail saying okay. And the first instant court said that this is not an arbitration clause and didn't execute the award. As you can imagine, the winner in the award uh, was very upset. The truth is that that can be a warranty for the defendant if the award is too onerous or against law, but it's a great difficult for awards needing the help of courts because sometimes you have a quick award but a very delayed execution in the court. Additionally, awards are subject to, revision, to review of courts. According to Article 41 of Arbitration Law, the uh, Civil and Criminal Chamber of the, uh, of the High Regional Court uh, is the competent to do that. That's the uh, chamber where, where I am actually working, working. But this review can only be based in five questions. Mainly uh, is that arbitration agreement, mainly for our purposes uh, to be taken into account, is that arbitration agreement does not exist or is, it not, is not valid, or that the award is in conflict with public policy. 
de la no de re, regarding the procedure, eh, when the arbitrator, arbitrator decides over a question not submitted of, to decision or other, or other matters, but I think that for my talk today, the relevance are A and E. Uh, especially, uh, the arbitration agreement is not valid. For instance, if it is imposed against law or not. Additionally, foreign awards have to be executed in Spain uh, with only with two limitations according to New York Convention that are similar to Article 41 law of the law. Uh, the subject matter of the difference is not capable of settling by arbitration under the law of that country, of Spain in this case, or the correct recognition or enforcement of the award would be contrary to the public policy of that country. Uh, that, as we can see, are in most ways similar, because probably uh, if there is no, uh, there is no uh, agreement, arbitration agreement or it is not valid, probably we could say that it is against the public policy, no? Because public policy, I have a I know what is public policy. I don't know. There are several professors of international public law in this room which could uh, explain it obviously better than me, no? But public policy is everything and is nothing. And it's a good reason when you don't want to execute an award, you say, okay, that is against public policy. It's something I have here. Um, uh, a, tra a definition of Tynet for uh, internet and says uh, uh, public policy is both a uh, ubiquitous and fundamentally important part of private international law. So yeah, they say, we don't know what is, and, but it, it's useful for many purposes. Usually to, to protect your local defendant from an aggressive uh, foreign plaintiff, no? I think that <laughs> <laughs> of public law. <laughs> I don't know if you agree, the professor or the professor, <laughs> but it, probably it's not the academic purpose, but probably it's the most, most times used, uh, pur uh, the purpose that most times have been used, no? Uh, and I have a, a big definition that I will not read. Uh, uh, I say the defining, it defines the limits of the tolerance of difference implicit in rules of choice of law and the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments. It has, however, been frequently criticized for its uncertainty and discretionary character, the proper definition size. And that will be usually the fight uh, in my experience. Uh, I only have experience with international awards. We have not had any international award execution or recognition before our court uh, since I am a member, uh, but almost everyone says that uh, the award is against the public policy. Right, because the other, um, the other reasons, if the arbitrator is at least a little bit careful with his work, it's almost impossible that he's not congruent, that there is no arbitration clause. Uh, always say, okay, it's against public policy. Typical claim is the valuation of the proof is against public policy. And we have to say, valuation of the proof, proof valuation, sorry, is not a matter that can be reviewed by the court because everyone uh, tries to, to make a second instance. And that's another important question. Procedure from Article 41 is not a second, second instance, you say, in English? Second, uh, eh? and it's not an appeal, okay. I've been reading John Grisham books for three days to try to obtain this vocabulary, but I am losing it. <laughs> uh, the appeal is not an appeal, it's a special procedure, procedure just in a few matters. Yeah, and if we leave away these this, uh, concrete matters, the word is fully enforceable in Spain by means of courts. Additionally, another problem with arbitration, and I think that this important submission to clauses, is, and especially to protect the um, weaker part of the contractual relationship, is that arbitration, arbitrators cannot make preliminary questions either before, neither before the Spanish Constitutional Court nor the European Court. And this is very important. An arbitrator, if he thinks that a law is against the Constitution or the European Union, cannot make a preliminary judgment. Probably he might raise the question uh, in the award and the court that has to review the award 
could make either one of them, either one or the other, but the truth is that he cannot do that. Also, recently a property register in, in, in the Basque country has said that a post-constitutional law is against the constitution, a harsh denied description of the, of the deed. I suppose that my colleagues will do something with that. And finally, it's uh, another relevant question, that arbitration, and that I mentioned above. Admit arbitration is very expensive. And I think that is the main matter relating when you have to sign, for instance, your company, you have international clients, I suppose, and you sell something to a um, company in Canada, and they say, okay, no problem, but arbitration will be before the Manitoba Arbitration Court. And you say, okay, that's funny. What is Manitoba? First question, I think that's in Canada. <laughs> No, Wikipedia is funny for that kind of questions because you seem that you are working and you are working in Wikipedia, what is this, no? <laughs> and, but this is a way that being assured that uh, you will not never have an arbitration claim before the Manitoba court or only will have that if it is that your final solution, but not for that, for that contract by the final solution by your company, probably. You will try if you find money and a Manitoba lawyer who wants to work with a Spanish small company who, who will, will have to pay in advance, for instance, the lawyer in, in Canada. So, this, uh, and taking that into account, uh, and being arbitration always complementary to regular justice, uh, there is a way that once we have uh, signed uh, an arbitration clause, anyone that is not a consumer, that we have, we have seen is protected by, cons by consumer legislation against arbitration or submission to courts, uh, clauses uh, that are exotic to the contractual relationship. Uh, can we do something? Because Article 24 of the Constitution says that every person has the right to obtain the effective protection of the judges and the courts in, ex in the exercise of his, his or her legitimate rights and interests. And in no, in no case may he go undefended. Mm. And all persons have the right to access to the ordinary judge predetermined by law. Can we, on the basis of that, challenge a clause of arbitration if we are a company that have signed a contract stating that? It's not an easy matter. Uh, um, we, we know that mandatory, once, uh, once a law in Spain establishes a mandatory um, arbitration uh, regarding land transportation, it was uh, an, uh, the Constitutional Court in 1995 uh, uh, said that uh, mandatory uh, arbitration established by law is against the Spanish Constitution. But uh, what happens is says there is no law, but it's business negotiation uh, that what makes us to sign that. What happens if your client forces you to accept CCI arbitration, for instance, on any dispute regarding a contract of uh, 20,000 euros, a small contract? For instance, uh, Jimeno Sandra Professor has an article of that. I think that he has also member. He has also been a member of the constitutional court or any kind of public body has been, and he says that, for in his opinion, uh, that kind of clauses establishes in standard preformulated contracts uh, are against the probably are uh, not valid under Spanish law. Uh, he, he and that kind of contracts are very common in consumers, but also in companies are very typical. Uh, you receive a um, uh, pedido, you know the word in English, it's a purchase order, sorry, uh, from your client, and you look the and it says, I want uh, one, I don't know, I want one piece of iron, and you look around and you have uh, a small letter six, the full page in the back, and one of the things says that any dispute will be subject to uh, to the courts of usually the domicile of the of the main contractor. Uh, he says that also uh, a standard contract has to be signed, for instance, to as I said, to go to Olympic Games. It's not the back page; it's about uh, 
10 or 20 pages, but it's a standard contract. Every sportsman that goes there has to sign. No? Uh, Cristiano Ronaldo inclu included. He has gone, I think not, because Portugal usually uh, does not go to his uh, Antonio <laughs> 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 yes. So what happens if you have to sign that contract? Can you sue it before courts that close? Can we claim that you have a defect in contract, in consent, pursuant uh, Article 1265 of the Spanish Civil Code that said that consent given pursuant to error, duress, intimidation, or fraudulent, fraudulent misrepresentation shall be null and void? I think that is a good question. I have no answer. As I said, I am just, I, I've just come to make questions to you, not to solve them. We shall try to solve them. Uh, all jointly, and I think that we, we will not solve because uh, we are up to when the U Supreme Court or the European Court has a rule on that, uh, we cannot say. I had a, a professor when I was studying procedure, procedure law in Spain that said that truth is, okay, he said in Spain that sounds better. Verdad es lo que en sala de cinco dicen tres. That in English, in English is uh, the truth is what in a chamber of five say three. I have to explain that in the past, when this uh, sentence was made, uh, in Spanish courts, in Supreme Courts, always well chambers of five members, with one sole exception. A very um, sometimes has been mentioned in the ancient, in the uh, before, no. Uh, when the previous uh, speaking has spoke about the death penalty, no capital penalty, uh, when the Supreme Court has a, a case uh, that was related to criminal to uh, death penalty, the chamber was of was of seven members, and they needed five to sentence to death. It was a, it was supposed to be a a guarantee of the, but usually major legal decisions in space were taken by chambers of five. So three of them were enough to say what is truth in Spain for legal purposes. So up to what time that today in a chamber of three, say two, uh, in this matter, uh, we cannot say if the, we can defend that uh, an arbitration clause is against Article 1265 of the Civil Code. Uh, because, okay, we can claim, but we, will it be successful? Can we uh, uh, allege that there is intimidation? Uh, this is a very complex proof problem, probably, and a very complex uh, perception by the members of the court of what are business relationships. Notice that we don't have an Anglo-Saxon system of justice where judges are former lawyers, mainly, or former professors. Uh, probably 70% of Spanish judges are people well trained, but the only work has been being a judge. They made the exam just when they finished the career. I suppose that in Italy is similar, no? You have an exam, but you don't need any kind of legal experience before, only your degree and knowing a lot of papers that I have to recognize that I will probably never have been capable to learn. That's why I, I accepted by the other way to the, to the courts, no? But uh, so when you have been dealing with, nego with negotiations, as for instance Pablo is dealing now, I suppose, you know that um, equality of the parties is a, a nice word, but probably is not the reality. Always 50 to 50, I've never been. I've been 60 to 40, maybe. And I've been uh, 85 to 15. And you have to defend your 15 as, as one as you can. And if you impose a, a strange uh, arbitration clause, for instance, you sign and you pray that it will never be needed. No? Can you claim intimidation, fraudulent mer mer misrepresentation? I don't know quite what it will be which will be the procedure to challenge that, uh, that, uh, that clause. Because Professor Jimeno Sendra uh, um, makes a, 
a procedure, no? He says, you have to denounce the defect from the beginning, even before fulfillment, because he says, for instance, you have to denounce the defect from the beginning, even before fulfillment of contract obligations. Okay, so you sign the contract, and before fulfilling your obligations, you say that the contract is not valid. What happens in real world if you do that? If you do that? that you will never receive your money. <laughs> That's the fair answer. Yeah. Eh? Will you lose your contract or will you keep it? Afterwards, you have to opposite the arbitration to arbitration procedure. Okay, that you can do. You can say, I think that the, there is no valid arbitration clause because I was uh, intimidated by my client, maybe. And the award, challenge the award before the relevant court when you have an award that says that the that the clause is, uh, is uh, correct according to law and also that the word is against your interest. The court, can the court, and the court could be the constitutional or European question, no? Uh, and trying to, to discuss, discuss if there is a public order. But this procedure works if you are the defendant, but what happens if you are the, if you are the claimant, you have to sue the other part. You can go to court, so sue before court. The other part will immediately say that the court is not, has no jurisdiction. If the court says I have jurisdiction, okay, you continue, continue before court. But if the court says, okay, the other, the defendant is, uh, okay, I have no jurisdiction. You have then go to arbitration, lose arbitration, and afterwards in execution and arbitration, uh, try to prove that the relevant clause is against law. Okay, that is funny, it's interesting, it has been, it, that uh, interpretation of law has been given me the, the opportunity to speak to you, but you all, we all know that this is not, uh, in real world, this is not a solution. <coughs> because it's long, expensive, complex, the client, you lose your client, for, of course, he will never buy you. Eh? And can a company do that? I don't know. I am going to conclude. I don't know how, for how much time I have been speaking. If I... 40, 40 minutes. Eh? For 40 minutes. 40 minutes? Yes. My, <laughs> my holy goodness. <laughs> uh, yet, to conclude, I say again that I have no answer. And probably, yes, I, I don't know how you say in English that me enrollo como las, pan, las persianas. <laughs> I suppose that is a translation, <laughs> but, but I don't know. Eh, eh, probably the general answer I say is that pacta sunt servanda, and if you have signed the contract, including an arbitration clause, you have to deal with it and live with it. But eh, there are situations where one of the parties is less powerful than the others, and Legislative, both European and internal legislative powers agrees that, for instance, a private consumer is less powerful than a company. So why not a, why not a small company is less powerful than a big one? Eh, eh, why do they not need uh, legisla legislative protection or court protection? That is my personal opinion. Uh, I raised the question and I would like to, to hear your opinions. Now it's your time. Just giving again my appreciation to Governance Institute for allowing me to speak here today. And, I, and again, begging your pardon for my English. As I said, this is my first public speech in, in English. Uh, and I, I hope that it will, it, will be, it will not be the last one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Borja. It has been very interesting. You shared with us your experience as a well and reputable lawyer, and now as a member of of the of the court. Uh, so it's been really, really, really interesting sharing your your, your thoughts with, with us. And uh, you will have uh, the both sides of the same coin uh, as professional lawyer and now as a public servant uh, applying applying the law. Uh, so it's, uh, from my side, it has been very, very interesting. I don't know if you have any, any queries. Uh, yes, please. Senor Judge, uh, I was just uh, hearing something new in, in, 
in the view of arbitration. Usually when I sit on arbitration conferences, we think of ourselves that we are supermen or superwomen. <laughs> Uh, now I heard something new and different, and I would like uh, to ask you whether you can post uh, the Constitutional Court decision of Spain of 1995 for the mandatory arbitration, if you can supply our project uh, with that uh, Constitutional Court decision. Because I can find mandatory arbitration clauses in a lot of European countries. For example, in, in Croatia we can find for the disputes be between medical doctors and their uh, and the medical fund uh, or bylaws uh, in, in sport organizations. Then even we can find mandatory arbitration clause or, or possibility in bankruptcy proceedings in, in Croatia with the order of judge. Actually, we have arbitration without consent. And there is a huge debate, I think, now in the United States, but without success on Arbitration Fairness Act. Uh, so this is something new. When I sit, usually we say in favor of arbitration. Now I, I heard some new voices. Maybe we have to think about that thoroughly. Because there are voices uh, that say that arbitrations are actu actually uh, professors or elites, uh, corrupt, and we wish to evade uh, general court system. Thank you. Okay, first, uh Okay, uh, the, okay, yes. uh, the question uh, uh, was raised in the uh, law for land transport, established that several contracts issued by companies uh, uh, had to be submitted to arbitration. It was challenged before the court. The judgment, I have the number here, it's uh, from 1995. I will. Pro I have the number here. I will provide you later, uh, and it said that it's uh, against the right to a due pr procedure. What they said is that um, uh, always the parties ha must have the right to deny arbitration and to go before courts. Now it has been some, it has been substituted by a system of um, voluntary arbitration. For, that was um, besides it was for small claims regarding trans, uh, uh, transportation of of goods, uh, but it was a challenge. The court said that it was against the the law uh, for forcing one forcing the parties to go to arbitration. Now it has been submit, uh, substituted by a new system of voluntary arbitration voluntary, highly encouraged by the law arbitration, but uh, because you have, but one of the parties can in, in a stage say that they don't want arbitration. I think I am not uh, uh, an expert in arbitration, in, sorry, in transport uh, questions, in transport uh, questions, so I don't know what is happening really in, in the companies. I suppose that mainly, main, uh, companies uh, will go to arbitration because it's a small, it's, it's for small co for small amounts, and in companies for small amounts, maybe if both companies are similar, maybe useful, because it's very quick the procedure. Also for consumers, uh, public uh, bodies in Spain are encouraging arbitration for consumers. Trying to avoid, if you buy a, a mobile phone and it doesn't work properly, they don't want to go to court with that. They prefer to go to to, co to consumer arbitration courts. But the individual, the consumer, only, always can go to court. Only the company can say, the company say, I will go always to arbitration, has to go once the consumer has decided. But it's not uh, mandatory. I don't know which is the reason. Okay, I've made a joke about uh, mistrust in arbitration by courts and by judges. It's a joke, but it's not a complete joke, as I say. Uh, some of my colleagues, and I may share this opinion to some extent, not fully, think that uh, sometimes there's a big discussion in Spain, okay, we are privatizing um, Educa education. Oh, that's horrible. We are privatizing, uh, privatizing uh, health care. Oh, that's horrible. We are privatizing justice. That's fine. That's modern. That's marvelous. 
That is what we see in the paper, in the media. I, I, don't, I am not giving an opinion. And some say, okay, be careful with arbitration. Yeah, because sometimes it's a complex matter. You move sometimes uh, in Anglo-Saxon legal system. What is, uh, you are from Croatia, I th no, I think. So, and I think, do you have a continental legal system? But when you move uh, around, uh, around Anglo-Saxon legal system, but it's very common now in the, today's Lex Mercatoria is mainly Anglo-Saxon legal system, no? And contract, an agreement of uh, uh, 20, uh, 200 pages, 20 pages of definitions. I don't know why, why they are, why, what do they serve for? I suppose that in Anglo-Saxon law is very important, but from our perspective as practicing lawyers in Spain, okay, definition. Parties, parties will mean party. Okay, I know, no? I have a friend that made a joke. He always made a joke, no? And, and means that the previous word and the subsequent word go together, no? Definition of and, no? <laughs> because sometimes you read something like that in the contracts, no? And one of the problems of arbitration is that the uh, uh, influence of Anglo-Saxon legal system that I don't see that is uh, I don't see that it is worse than us. I think that we are taking the bad part because the criminal, the guarantees of the parties in criminal procedure that are very important in Anglo-Saxon world are less important for us. And I think that uh, this, that's a capital issue. Uh, the right, uh, the pres presumption of innocence is said in English. The right to not declare against you that kind of thing, we are not taking that, but all the private law is uh, flooding over the businesses now, in sports, for instance. The court of, of arbitration for sports is fully uh, uh, in, aligned with the Anglo-Saxon. Labor questions are, arbit are subject to arbitration or can be subject to arbitration in many countries in the Anglo-Saxon world. Doping is a private question, not a public question in the Anglo-Saxon world. Okay, so if, if, he, if he has to do with drug smuggling, yes, it's a public question. But if you have a pill that is fully legal, but it makes you run quicker, that's not a private question. That is not a public question, sorry, no? So that's why I think that arbitration uh, has to be, in some, to some extent, uh, taken in, in, with care by us, because sometimes you sign uh, an arbitration clause and you have a, a arbitration in an Anglo-Saxon country or in Paris subject to English law, and sometimes uh, that kind of clauses are signed very happily by parties, or otherwise you don't have another, because if a big uh, multinational company comes, say, okay, you have to sign that or otherwise you have no client, because that is usually the negotiation is, I am going to buy that number of items at this price, and this is the contract. And you say, but I want to change. Okay, that's funny, no. Usually that's how, afterwards lawyers uh, can be discussing for two weeks, but finally the first version of the contract issued by the powerful with two stupid amendments just to justify that something has been negotiated, is signed. And that is the problem, I think. And sometimes, uh, I know that for, for big companies, arbitration is very good. But uh, no, and that is what I think that why the Spanish Constitutional Court thought that uh, mandatory arbitration is against the right to due process. You have always to have the choice the problem is that the problem that, that I wanted to raise is if you have really a choice or not a choice, because sometimes in contracts, that's, I, I will give you the number of the judgment, and I don't know if it is available in English in the internet. I will check that later. That you, you say español, so I will give you the the reference. Thank you. Hello. Uh, just a few thoughts uh, provoke me your presentation. Well, the first, the first thing is uh, we are trying to imagine uh, what is more appropriate for uh, address the business uh, human rights impacts 
uh, mostly abroad, extraterritorial uh, cases, but including in European Union as well. If it is, if it's the, this um, alternative remedy instrument that is called arbitration could be uh, interesting for improve the effectiveness, access to remedy for the victims uh, in that business uh, uh, abuse on human rights. So it's just for focus my my question. One thing is um, well, another thing is uh, there's a, a, a international initiative coming from the states that is trying to uh, put in in, in place a international arbitration on business and human rights. And so it's a it's a issue now. So we have to think about that. Is is the, is the is the upper paid instrument to defense and to repair business, business and human, uh, human rights abuses by businesses. One thing that has been raised in your intervention was a risk on impartiality, independency, and integrity of the court, of the arbitration court. The other is economical barriers or the uh, unbalanced power of the parties. I completely agree with, th with that. But one idea that you, you have said, that this, uh, I think is coming from the co uh, constitutional or continental approach of the law, it is that the, the, um, the judgment on fundamental or constitutional rights uh, was not produced in arbitration court. So it should be, the, there's no, um, uh, jurisdiction on that matters, so it should be uh, transferred directly to the appropriate court. I think just for verify that is, uh, that's, that's right, because in that case, uh, uh, human rights violation should be part of fundamental rights, so uh, uh, that should, I assume that the consequence of that, that is arbitration is not the right tool to, to resolve that. The other thing is, in, in the, the, the approach of a, a human right abuse or violation could be a civil commercial litigation or civil commercial law, but we're looking for a, a conflict between businesses, suppliers and, and, and the company, or, but even a criminal effect as well. So uh, in, in that case, I consider that in the grave abuses, a violation, arbitration is not the appropriate grievance mechanism. But it's just for confirming with you, what, what is your opinion? Criminal yeah, criminal issues. <laughs> yeah, the grave human rights abuses yeah, that approve. could be uh, used the, the arbitration. And, from from and, our uh, perspective, uh, criminal, no, no, we, we, no, no, we are having in Spain criminal mediation it is very strange to us, not arbitration, but mediadores, uh, mediators in small crimes. But for criminal law, I think that uh, that it's a complex from our, our perspective of law. And I don't know if in the States it's possible to have an arbitration on crime. I don't mean that the criminal law should be doing by arbitration. I, see, I said if it's a grave human rights abuses, yeah. could be a criminal offense yeah. on that. So uh, maybe it's not the best way to to pursue the, the the persecution of that or to the, the access to remedy on that too. Okay, but uh, the point is, just what do you think that is uh, the the, um, the 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 funda the human rights violation should be or could be uh, resolved in in arbitration scheme? Uh, one question. First, uh, when, I've, when I've been speaking about arbitration, I've said that uh, arbitration ha gives rise to some troubles. And I know that I've mentioned, as I was speaking, the problem with uh, impartiality of the arbiter. But what I, what I try to explain with the problem, I am not saying that arbitra arbitrators are less reliable than judges. There are good arbitrators 
and bad arbitrators, and good, good judges and bad judges. What I say is that having a procedure abroad is complex. For instance, uh, I think that you are from Spain, no? This conversation should be more fluent, easier, and more interesting for both of us in Spanish. Because we, are, we both are not speaking in our mother tongue. That's a problem. For me, I've been speaking for 45 minutes, for 40 minutes. I, I thought that I had a speech for 20 or 15. Why? Because I don't know how to measure the way I speak in, in English. I know, how, I know how to prepare a talk in Spanish. And now I suppose that I begin to know how to prepare a talk in English. A procedure in a foreign language abroad subject to different uses is more complex than a, than, than a local procedure. And I'm not speaking of uh, bad behavior of the arbitrator. That's another problem that might happen. Yeah, and the court also. We are going to speak later about the foreign non-convenience in the, in the America, no? The United States. Okay, I think that the United States is a great country and they have a great legal system. But foreign non-convenience is a good way to save the us I am sorry for the expression of several American companies. The famous problem in Bhopal of um, Union Carbide. Mm -hmm. We speak later, but we can speak later about that. So I say, you go to another country, and the foreigner is always in a worse position than the local one. That's what I said. Not that I think that the arbitration will sell the, will sell the world. That that can happen, of course. That can happen, and probably happens sometimes, but a few times. The problem is that you are, when you are playing out of your field, you are more, comf you are more uncomfortable than at home. Regarding human rights, okay, I am not an expert in human rights. Probably Professor Pokar can speak a lot about that. Is arbitration a solution? Okay. I don't know. I don't know because it depends on the kind of human rights. Uh, on how can arbitration can be a way? For instance, once one party has said, "Okay, I have committed a crime against uh, human rights, and I'm going to pay an amount to indemnize," how to that amount is determined, and how that amount is split between the people can be a question subject to arbitration. But uh, human rights uh, protection subject, okay. If they, it has been the court for Rwanda, I think. If you go to arbitrate in the middle of the uh, Tutsis and Hutus, uh, you, can, you have nothing to, arbit to arbitrate there. The only way to, but even a court, a judge, okay, a judge can go with an army and stop. But he doesn't stop. He doesn't stop the, he doesn't stop the, the war. The war is stopped by an army. Let's say arbitration can be a, in my opinion, eh? I am not an expert on that matter, but can be a, a way to to determine uh, indemnities, to pay them. But no, I don't see a way to to solve a problem. That's my opinion. Eh? I am not. Uh, that's a complex question, especially international issues related to to human rights. Okay, thank you. Also, we have Xavier Ezizabarrena joining us. Uh, he's teacher at the Universidad de País Vasco and Universidad de Deusto, and he's also a lawyer. And we have also, indeed, uh, Jesus de la Fuente, who is chief executive officer of Rafenea. Perhaps they can share with us uh, some of his of their experience regarding human rights. Uh, uh, we have today two cases in order to deal with Amoco Cadiz and Prestige, huge environmental damage. Uh, the corporation, in one of the cases, Amoco Cadiz, has been declared liable. A group of companies has been declared liable. In the case of the Prestige, the case is already open. Uh, no companies, no individuals have been found guilty for the, this tremendous damage to the shore of Spain and France. Uh, I know I know quite quite well, quite well the prestige uh, case because I've been involved in advising one of the parties, uh, American Blue Shipping, with uh, Professor Juan Jose Alvarez, 
and the case is still open. But in any event, uh, human, right, human right in business is a key issue. And perhaps uh, we have here a chief executive office of a small company, but a very well-known company. Probably you are dealing with huge uh, large corporations. Uh, you are dealing also uh, when you want to, so you are care about environmental, because uh, your products take care about environmental and try to uh, to contribute to the to the development of a better world in this sense. No? Yes, yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having the opportunity to, to spend some minutes and spend my thoughts about this topic. And especially because I'm not a lawyer at all, so I have a very limited knowledge of, of all these matters. So, but first of all, uh, I want to, to say that human rights and businesses are exactly the same. Human rights without economy, without development, technology development, uh, th there is nothing. So if, if we take back uh, 1,000 years uh, in the past, so probably the human rights are much lower than nowadays. So, so businesses are the main part and the main power of their right development. Uh, so we have, if we analyze country by country or region by region, where we have more free market, more free competition, more transparency, we have much more human rights. And in the part of the world that we have less businesses, we have less human rights. Uh, so and one, one critical point here, and, and it's related with these two cases, is that uh, uh, it's important that if you generate any damage, you have to pay. That's very basic and that's very clear. And it's important that the payment must be done in a short time. Because in businesses, the, the, as you know, in the life, in financial business, one million euros of today worth much more than one million euros 20 years in the future. So it's totally unacceptable that these kind of cases are still open. So I think that, that, that uh, we need a much more clear, um, fast and deterministic uh, system to deal with all this, the, this business. And also, uh, we have to consider that all this kind of damage are not only to, to individuals, are also damage to other businesses, to, let's say in the uh, tourist industry or physics industry or even to the energy industry and so on. So uh, another very interesting uh, thing that I think that, that in the recent years is, is arising and, and is gaining a lot of momentum is the supplier responsibility programs. Uh, there is a well-known company, there's Apple, for example, but we have another very good expenses very near here. For example, Inditex, the Zara Group, has a extremely good supply responsibility program, and they do uh, uh, thousands or millions of audits to their suppliers to uh, warranty that they are uh, complaining with the uh, with uh, no more than 50 or 60 hours per week uh, work time, that uh, you are treating all the, the workers in an ethi ethically and fairly way. So that's, that, that, that's very important. And it's, it's much more faster and effective than any kind of uh, court or habilitation or governmental regulation or things like that. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, and for that, that works uh, at the end, we need free competition and transparency, and, uh, and that's the basic, uh, the basic uh, structure for, for this. So it's also important how we did, uh, how we make decisions on businesses. So in businesses, we try to avoid any risk, and we prefer certainty rather than uncertainty. So it's, it's very important to have a clear uh, perception that if any businesses or any individual is going to make a damage, that individual or that business will have to pay. That's important. So the main violation to the human rights are these very snail justice processes. Uh, okay. And also in businesses, we prefer negotiation or arbitration that could be in the middle uh, between the, 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 the typical courts and the, and the negotiation rather than uh, uncertainty uh, uh, scenarios. So um, 
um, so what are the main differences that, that we have to try to adapt, in my opinion, uh, the, the worldwide system to the real case of the company? So, so in one end, we have the businesses and the individuals that we prefer clear rules. So in the typical uh, justice systems, we have complex and non-deterministic uh, rules. So for the similar case, you have different uh, outputs. So that, that, that's totally crazy. Also, the businesses are totally global and international, and the justice systems are regional or local or, or in the best case, at uh, uh, continental levels. Uh, we prefer a speed, fast uh, processes, and typically it takes decades, uh, these kind of, of cases. Uh, we prefer simplicity and clear rules rather than complex and, and a lot of exceptions. Um, uh, uh, for better or worse, the, 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 the language and business is English. So, in, so businesses prefer English, and probably the, every local uh, justice systems, uh, for sure, will prefer their, their, their own local language. So, at the end, uh, just my, my main message here is that businesses and economic development is the base of the human rights, and we have to protect businesses and human rights because they are exactly the same. And it's unacceptable to have this a snail justice system and this complex justice system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jesus. Uh, the issue, for example, your company is a limited liability company, right? So yeah. you, you as a shareholder and the rest of the shareholders of your company uh, know that they have the protection of a company yes. in order to avoid being declared liable uh, for the company debts. But this is not the case of Amoco Cadiz. Okay? This is not the case of Amoco Cadiz. Because in this case, in Amoco Cadiz, because, uh, as I said, the general rule is limited liability for limited liability companies, for corporations. But in Amoco Cadiz, uh, they have the, the tribunal, the, the court, has declared, has pierced the corporate veil. What we call in Spain, levantamiento del velo societario. Okay? Piercing the corporate veil, which means that the court has declared the shareholders of the company to be liable. In, in Amoco Cadiz case, it's uh, the scenario of a group of companies. It's a typical scenario of a multinational company, which has a holding company with subsidiaries around the world. Okay? These subsidiaries, they are not branches. They are limited liability companies in order to avoid the liability to go up to the holding company. So, um, in order to apply the doctrine of piercing the corporate veil, there are some factors to be taken into account. Uh, one of the factors is whether the, the limited liability company is adequately capitalized. Another issue is the corporate, if the corporate formalities have been followed. Then, uh, if one of the entities of the group of companies mm -hmm is an alter ego or is instrumentally to the other entity. Whether the defendant, stockholder or member has engaged in fraud or wrongdoing. And finally, whether the case involves tort, uh, non-contractual liability or contractual, contractual claim. Regarding the, the first issue for piercing the corporate veil, the capitalization, International courts uh, use different measures to assess whether a corporation is or not adequately, adequately capitalized. Uh, and these measures depend on the nature and magnitude of the corporate undertakings. Uh, if the capital is deemed to be illusory, compared with the business to be executed by the, by the corporation, an entity can be deemed and, and, and they're capitalized, and then be, the shareholders be uh, declared liable for the company debts or for, for the company li li liabilities. Uh, in Spain, it's quite difficult this to occur because in Spanish law, uh, the Spanish law foreseen a minimum capitalized for limited liability companies. Okay? And also, depending on the type of business the company is going to execute, it has also uh, some minimum of capitalized to be reached. For example, private equity firms have uh, 
uh, an increase of this uh, limitation of, capita uh, of uh, capitability. In the States, no, this does not happen. Uh, for example, a corporation or a limited liability company in the state, normally it could be capitalized whatever you want with the amount you want. So it is very important to uh, capitalize the company in the way the type of business is going to execute. Otherwise, the doctrine of piercing the corporate rate, it could be applied. Uh, another issue of the, is the observation of of uh, corporate formalities <coughs> upon incorporation and on the day-to-day -day issues of the, of the companies. For example, if a company has distributed dividends without fulfilling the corporate rules for distributing dividends, if a company is an alter ego of, of, its, of its matter company, uh, and this is one of, the, uh, one of the issues that the American courts apply in order to declare the liability of the Amoco Cadiz. Also, the, the fraud when executing a business or the wrongdoing. And finally, the type of claim. It's not the same uh, non-contractual liability, like Amoco Cadiz or like Prestige. We are talking of a non-contractual liability than a contractual liability. Uh, Courts often distinguish between tort and contract claims for piercing the corporate rate purpose. Because courts are more sensitive to pierce the corporate veil on behalf of tort or other involuntary creditor than on behalf of a creditor who has voluntarily elected to look for a corporation credit. Uh, if you are signing a contract with, a, with another company, you normally, you can find out in the registry, there are no accounts. You can find out, find out who are the members of the board of directors or the management body of this company. So you have the opportunity to check uh, if this company is in good health or not, is in good shape or not. If you are, you are suffering non-contractual damage, uh, this uh, do not apply. So these are the main issues that courts normally apply in order to seek uh, liability uh, uh, beyond the corporate structure. Okay? So the corporate structure is not always, is not, is not always the, 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 uh, the solution to avoid being declared liable. Uh, regarding the, the, prestige, the prestige, I don't know if in, in Amoco Cadiz uh, you have some, some of you have any thoughts to share with us, or we can go through also regarding prestige. You, for example, Xavier, I don't know, you are a lawyer. Uh, yes. Yes, yes, indeed, indeed. Yes, yes, please. <coughs> Thank you. I'm Catherine Kisejian from Paris. I'm a professor at the university. I teach human rights and business. Uh -huh. And I am also um, an arbitrator and a mediator. Um, it's, it's wonderful that you have accepted to be on the panel because it's very rare <laughs> that we have businesses represented in those meetings. When we speak about human rights and business, usually we have a lot of NGOs, some uh, advocates, sometimes judges, but very often the business seat is empty. So thank you. This is wonderful. <laughs> thank you. I have one question for you and one remark. Okay. My question is, on the website of your company, Graffiana, I saw that Repsol has a role. And my question to you is, what kind of a role Repsol has in your company, whether it's your mother company, whether it has invested and has some control over your company, because as you probably know, uh, what is developing now in the, both in France and in the European Union, and also under the UN uh, RUGI principles, there is a, a kind of liability thread uh, from the mother company to subsidiaries, and 
to companies which are under the influence mm -hmm. or control to concepts which you are not a lawyer, but I think as a businessman you must understand because they are not purely legalistic concepts. Mm -hmm. So it's the thread of liability through control and influence yeah. um, which puts some kind of obligations and accountability um, um, you know, issues on both the mother company and the other companies um, in the thread. So that's my question. My remark is about your link between competition and human rights. And I must say here, I respectfully completely disagree with you. And I will give you a good example. And I hope you will, after the example, you will agree with me. The example is the Rana Plaza. The what? The Rana Plaza. Rana Plaza. Ah, very interesting. So you don't even know the case. The case is about a building in Bangladesh with more than a thousand employees in that building. Mm -hmm. That building collapses in the building and there are hundreds of people dead and the other rest of the salaries are um, severely injured. In the, in the building, in the rubbles of the building, uh, we find labels of Auchan and uh, a lot of other uh, French companies, some uh, Spanish companies, all of that in the clothing business, garment, mm -hmm. okay? And most of them women, um, young people working there. And there is um, an interview of uh, the manager of the company, who own Rana Plaza. And what the guy is telling us is absolutely fascinating. And I come to the competition issue. He says the competition is putting so much pressure on us that we have to produce t-shirts, and I'm just taking the, the, the t-shirt example, for 50 centimes of euro. And when we are asking for a small increase like 60 centimes, it's not so much, to, in order for us to be able to maintain the building so that it is not going to collapse on our employees, this is refused by the companies who are giving us the orders. So more competition, in my view, cannot be equated with human rights. Yes, the problem is that you have different markets there. And unfortunately, in India, there is no competition in the labor market because India is a still a, a country under development. So that's the problem because the, the people and the, and, the, and the investors and the, and the labor force in India has not the possibilities. Uh, they are much better than 50 years in the past. Uh, and for sure, in 50 years in the future will be much better than today. But the problem is that there is not a, a fully uh, developed uh, market in India, like in some parts of China and in other countries in the world. Yes, th that's it. That's it. If you have, if, if the people has the rights to, to, to select where the company they want to, to work, uh, the talent people and the smart people will work for the better companies and they have the better salaries and the better working conditions and they will be much more productive. And that's exactly that happens in all the parts of the world, from Spain to US to China and also in India. And the, I, I agree that India is a especially large and complex uh, uh, country and they have a lot of uh, cultural challenges and a lot of things there but, but, but I'm not an expert on India but, but for sure uh, the economic development in India uh, is helping uh, to increase the life expectancy uh, and reduce the poverty and so on but the, the bad side is we have a, 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 a long work still in India and in other countries of the world especially in Africa too yeah. And, and answering the, the, the question about Repsol, Repsol is an investor for us. Um, uh, so the, the venture capital fund of the company. And, and I totally agree with you. And for example, we received several audits from them. 
to, to, to assure that we have complied with all the regulations, uh, protection of the environment, health and safety, uh, for sure, financial and so on, yes. And also it's my main concern because I'm the main stockholder of the company and my main concern is to try to generate value. So, and the way to generate value is not to break the rules or make damage to rest. So the, the make to generate value is to try to do things in the right way and, and produce really good uh, uh, materials for the rest of the, of the community, for the rest of the business industry. So, and that's our focus. Uh. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I don't know if Xavier, uh, do, do you want to share some, some issues with us? Yes, okay, very briefly. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you very much to the organizers and governance, Katarina Yanivas and all the, the team for the opportunity. It is always a, a pleasure being here. Secondly, to present my excuses because I, I was late. So, uh, well, there was a session in the provincial parliament about waste management and this is an issue nowadays in Gipuzkoa. I never thought that I was going to be involved in waste management from the <laughs> political legal point of view, but that's a part of my, of my, of my issue, of my topic nowadays, so, so my excuses. Going to, to the topic, what I will just try to do is to make like a, a very, very brief uh, comparative approach uh, among both cases, no? the Amoco Cadiz and the Prestige. It is a, a very complex thing and we've heard uh, a, few, a, few, a few things about it. Um, in particular, well, the, the complexity of the piercing of the veil and so on, it is a complex thing in, in, in civil law, in, in market law, in criminal law, and even in, in environmental law, which is my, my field in theory. So I'm going to speak uh, from the point of view of, of an environmental lawyer. Uh, I could be speaking from another point of view, but uh, in this case, from the point of view of the environment, of the conservation of the res resources, of the protection of nature, let me say that the, the portrait is, is very poor, in my view. Of course, it is a subjective point of view, but it is also based uh, upon practice. And, and if we could analyze the, that idea in, in three, four uh, main sub-ideas, what I would suggest firstly is the, the, the timing, for example, no? because the, the Amoco Cadiz took place in the 78, uh, and the prestige took, happened in, in 2002. So there's a long time uh, between both accidents. And we'll see how, for example, the legal response of the US jurisdiction, I think you, you've been hearing about it during the, the last time, well, it is arguable, but it is an advanced uh, response. It is a serious response. In terms of uh, qualitative and the quantitative approach of the liability, it is a much uh, higher approach than the Spanish jurisdiction with the prestige, for example. So in terms of the timing, we can say, wait, from, from the 78 towards 2002, there's a huge evolution on law in European Union, in Spain, in the US, and so on. But the solution given in the first uh, judgment at the United States in the 88 is much more advanced than, than, than the Spanish solution in 2012. And, 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 not, and not very pro-American in that way, and more, more, more an Anglo-Saxon uh, guy. But let me say, in this sense, well, in the European Union, we are still far away from the solutions of the United States. And let me suggest that, for example, in the United States, there are two fields which are very, very strict and very serious. One is consumer's law. When something happens uh, concerning consuming, it is a serious thing in the US. And another one is environmental law. Another thing is how the United States behaves internationally with environmental law. <laughs> but in domestic issues, it is a, 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 an important point. And we see how they deal, in a way, with the Amoco Cadiz, with a very uh, strict liability, and with a very important amount of, of uh, civil liability in the first appeal, eh? and even a higher one in the second appeal. On the other hand, we see that, that in, in the Spanish case, well, the case went through the criminal court. Firstly, it was against the, the captain of the, of the tanker, um, and the result is extremely poor. In terms of liability, there's nearly nothing. In terms of liability, there is only the P&I system of protection, which is okay, that is fine, but it has nothing to do with environmental law. It has nothing to do with the protection of the environment. It has nothing to do with the protection and conservation of fisheries. That's another thing. It's the classic idea of civil law, um, direct economic damage and profit and, and lose profit. So that, that, that was in, in, invented by Romans. I mean, so 
it is not a huge advance. Uh, so that would be a, a first idea. A second one is to distinguish, which, which was quoted by, by Mr. Paisan, of course, the, the different uh, roles of uh, liability. In this case, in the US, the case went through civil liability. In the Spanish case, it was criminal li li liability. But moreover, there was a, a, an important uh, decision on, on forum shopping in the, in the case of the Amoco Cadiz. And that was very good for the plaintiffs. Of course, you have to take the time, the money, the lawyers, and the whole infrastructure to, to go uh, to present a formal claim in the United States. But in, in, in that sense also, uh, forum shopping, foreign shopping was, was very useful. Um, so th th those would be like two or three main, main, main ideas. No? In, in another way, if we try to link the whole thing with human rights, it is also an issue, and it is a very complicated issue because we, we, we would require to go to the regulation of every country. No? And, well, for example, in the Spanish case, we got a provision concerning the environment in Article 45, uh, which uh, assumes that there is a right uh, to an adequate environment in Spain, but even though it is a fundamental right, it is not uh, a right that we could directly apply uh, onto the Constitutional Court, eh, because the, those are only between the 14th and the 30th. So we got a trouble there, and in, in some other juridic jurisdictions, in, in particular in South America, there are some other different approaches to that idea. But we have to go state by state, having a look at what's our Constitution saying about the recognition of this right as, an ad as a fundamental real right. In the Spanish case, it is not a fundamental right. It is part of the Constitution, but it's, as you know, a principle of uh, economic development, and it is a mandate towards the, the public administrations. So we have to go also analyzing every case uh, one by one. And on the other hand, if we, want, if we would like to apply internationally in the European Union, well, the only way forward would be the Euro European Court of Human Rights. Of course, we got the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, the International Court, uh, Court of Justice, and those, are, uh, those, those structures are, are in force, of course, but uh, normally, in general, with, a, with some exceptions, they are void to, to, to citizens, so those would be liabilities of the state. So, well, in, in five, ten minutes, I think the portrait would be very, very difficult. But in, in conclusion, the, the, the general idea about protecting the environment, it, uh, it's developed in the recent uh, decades. It is there, it is law in force, but at the end, it is not being applicable. What we are applying is the classic ideas of civil law, economic damage, and uh, lost profit. Well, uh, whether we like it or not, that's another issue, eh? but uh, well, I think that's more or less a, a pragmatic approach to what's happening uh, to environmental law uh, from the point of view of an environmental lawyer. Another thing is companies, uh, insurances, and it's a very complex thing. But anyway, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Xavier. I, 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 don't, I don't know if Borja want, wants to share also something with us. If you want, if I wanted just to make a brief comment on the on the, sorry, the, the, prestige the prestige case. I think that the problem with the prestige is that due to political reasons, the court was uh, badly determined. It was a civil issue, not a criminal issue. The problem was that there were politicals involved. Criminal courts are more sexy than civil ones. You have search warrants, people to prison. That sounds great for the papers. But the really is that criminal procedure in Spain is very complex, very long, and finishes with that. The first problem that we had is that according to Article, I think that is 263 of Montego Bay Treaty, if I don't know, the captain of a ship cannot be committed, cannot be sent to prison due to an, a sea accident, only provided that he has acted uh, bad and voluntarily bad. No? And that uh, the um, prestige case has finished as many people has predicted that that's going to finish. But the problem is that the people, especially due to political pressures, decided that to go to, if this, and in criminal courts, uh, you have to be more careful with the first. In Spain, at that time, we could not uh, condemn companies. Only from 2010, uh, there is the possibility to establish that companies are uh, liable to, pen, to, criminal, to crimes. 
Uh, so you cannot go to the company, you cannot uh, pierce the veil, you cannot make many things in the criminal courts that could, could, could uh, might be done in the criminal courts. Even you can try to do foreign shopping, as finally the Spanish government tried to do foreign shopping in the, in the United States and they couldn't achieve that. But in criminal courts, you cannot make uh, foreign shopping. You cannot uh, shoot before the federal court or <laughs> in the criminal bench because there is no federal crime in Spain. No, okay. Some some of them in the in Ronda in Rotam, those countries there are some problems of that, but not not here. But the problem is that the, this this is very typical in Spain. When I was practicing as a lawyer, it was typical the discussion within the firm. Okay, we we'll make uh, we we'll go to crime to crime procedure because the client sometimes feels more comfortable. But uh, if, the other, if the case is not clear and the other attorney is um, good, uh, good attorney, he can have you in the investigation court for 10 years. And in the civil procedure, you have a crime and he has 20 days to answer. And there is no more histories. Uh, but in the, in, in the in our criminal procedure, in the investigation phase, Everything, can, everything uh, can be appealed. Uh, so you are com continuously with uh, small appeals that uh, stop the procedure. Uh, you have a more, care, more troubles of constitutional law. You have to take care of the, of the rights of the people. So it was just a political decision just to fill in press uh, front pages that has finishes in that. And I think that the Supreme Court will do the same. I don't know, but I think that it will be the same. Thank you. Thank you very much, Borja. Uh, I don't know if someone from the, yes, is some, someone who wants to share also his thought with us. No, yeah, uh, it's just a very quick remark on the, on the La Puente speech. Well, first, uh, the it wasn't in India, it was in Bangladesh, the collapse of Rana Plaza. And secondly, um, the due diligence process in company is, every, everybody knows that it's very poor, so it's not really effective to identify and prevent and to resolve this risk situation of the government in Bangladesh. And secondly, the, we, we got a, a world problem that is a big impunity and the poor effectiveness of the grievance mechanisms or remedy, access to remedy for the victims. So it's no, it's no opinion. It's a recognition from the United Nations and it's, it's a big problem. So we are trying to figure what is the best way to resolve or to, to try to to put decisions on uh, grievance me mechanisms or uh, judicial courts oh, or I, whatever. <coughs> so it's, it's no uh, debate think, of, uh, de uh, yeah. about uh, uh, it I, is. I, I think that, that the probably the, the, the best tool nowadays is try to use the more popular the supplier responsibility reports uh, by large companies like Inditex or H&M or whatever in, in, this, in this industry, on in the garments industry. Uh, and they have to publish all the results of external audits with external auditors that check all the supplier value chain and uh, identify those kind of problems. Because probably, I don't know the, the, the local regulation in Bangladesh, but, but here the responsibility of uh, uh, the technical of the building responsibility, uh, uh, so, so probably in, in that case, uh, the company uh, must be not operating. For sure, but I know that India is a complex country and probably the, the local regulation is not enforced. But so I think that transparency and supplier responsibility programs are a very good tool to guarantee all this kind. For sure will be a, a terrible accidents or, or terrible problems in the future. For sure will be because risk, that there is no zero risk on any business activity, on any human activity. There is no zero risk. But we have to avoid and we have to guarantee that if 
someone at in the bad way, they have to damage. Even if it's not in, uh, uh, um, even if they are doing everything okay, but they have uh, generating a damage, uh, that company has to pay. That that's the big way that have the market to to try to resolve these these problems. Okay, I think that sorry, one of the problems with uh, suppliers in the third world is that uh, the local legislation uh, allows what is happening. And sometimes we don't remember that uh, that happened in Spain not many years ago. Uh, my father began, began to work before he was 14. Yeah. And it was typical. And now we have changed. And they have to change. But what we, sometimes happens that uh, we try, for instance, the index of death in working accident in Spain for a, in Sweden is incredible. They say, okay, you are a third world, and we are in some sense a third world country, because we have ratios absolutely, absolutely unacceptable for Northern Europe countries. And we don't think that is so, uh, but uh, you say uh, one, I think that is one worker per day or two per, that's, uh, that's not common in other countries. And I think that that kind of countries have to evolutionate. And I think that we, in the first world, we have a problem with that, uh, that problem of the, um, uh, the supplier um, responsibility program. Res res programs. That sometimes yeah. European consumers do not act according to a consumer responsibility program. What they try to say is, okay, I want a shirt from Zara, cheap, nice, change every year. That is impossible. Only with the children in Bangladesh. That is the only way. So probably what I have to do is don't buy in shirts in Zara. I am not saying that I have to do or that I am doing. I am too old and fat to buy clothes in Zara. But uh, what the idea is that I think that sometimes, like, okay, uh, I want a shirt 20 euros, but I want uh, Amancio to solve that. Okay, and he solves that, buying the shirt by four, by four centi, 15 cents in, Indo in Bangladesh, or in Indonesia, or in many other countries. Or even in Morocco, so it's not necessarily going too far away. In Morocco, we have that problem. And in some, I would like to know how much did he pay 20 years ago in Galicia, for instance, to the people that were uh, cosiendo, uh, neck, necting, no? How do you say coser? Uh, showing. But I say is sometimes the consumers have a power on that. Okay, say, and say, uh, but not you, but our attitude sometimes is, uh, okay, I want your product as you sell it today, but I want to change your chain of production. And probably what we have to say is, first, if you continue this way, I will not buy you. And second, I know that to improve the way of life of people in Bangladesh, I have to pay not 20, but 25. It's something that sometimes is not accepted. Mm -hmm. and, and it's part that we don't know our past. Or we don't want, we know our past, but we don't want to speak about that because like, children working, okay, our parents' generation were children working. With 14, before 14, my, my father before 14 was working in a company. And in the, in the land, in the agricultural works, with 10 years, people that today are 70 were working with 10 years in Spain. So we have to know what is our past and how has changed. And this is the way to change that. And why has changed? Because we have purchased more things, I think, and more expensive things. And that makes, but the, the, the attitude that is there, no, okay, they have to change, okay? Because it's unacceptable, okay? It's unacceptable, and I think that it's unacceptable that people with, uh, younger than 16 maybe are working. But it's part of our country not too many years ago. Okay? And the index of accidents in Spain, for instance, is unacceptable. It's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And people uh, from the northern, in Europe, you have read the statistics from the European Union, they say, okay, what is happening in Spain? I know that most of the, uh, there is a problem with the accidents in itinerary that uh, changes the statistics, I know. But I suppose that also Swedish have accidents in itinerary and they have uh, very, uh, they have a worse uh, climatology to drive and they have less accidents. This other thing that you have to, to think about. 
that what data is okay. That has to change, and I agree. But I don't know if the attitude in the first world that we are having is the because we don't. Uh, uh, I don't. I am not asking for a boycott to in the text, eh? <laughs> because sometimes uh, tomorrow in the papers, I am, uh, justice in Bilbao asks boycott for in the text because this work is works this way. But but I say is okay. If we want, they change their chain of supply. Probably we have to change our, cha of, or, our chain of supply. And sometimes it's something that, uh, and, I, I, and I think that they have to change. But they say, okay, no, if they, they fulfill local requirements, legal requirements, everyone. And, and that's happening. And we have some examples that that's happening. For example, the Nike uh, has a, a, a real problem with that. And, and the stock value of the market capitalization of the Nike company drop a lot. And they have uh, problems with the sales. So, so I think that, that that is working. But the human being has a solution for that. That is economic development. So uh, 200 years in the past, we were living in the same conditions like uh, India nowadays. 200 or, or, or 50. 50 years, years ago, years not ago. So, so we have uh, we have the same problem. So, and, and we have to focus on guarantee the freedom of the people and freedom of the businesses in in, in those countries because it's the only way uh, to move forward and to be much more uh, developing developed economies. Just short remark. I'm not going to monopolize the dialogue, but just. What is the role of law in this discussion and opinion? Because obviously there's another drivers that consumer pressure or any investor pressure. But what is the role of law and what is the role of access to justice in that case is that the grave violations of human rights because it's the, 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 the issue that we are discussing here. Obviously there are another drivers but and, and the, uh, obviously, I, I'm not. Comp I, I disagree completely with the, the competition approach. I'm I'm, I'm economist, and and this really unfair competition when in the cases that we are talking ab about, because we are talking about human rights dumping in in economy market. So we are not ab ab discussing about the fair competition between actors. We are discussing about and fair competition to, to go get profits for human rights abuses. I, I agree that you have to reduce and avoid unfair competition. I agree. I totally agree with that. And the tools are there. And the problem uh, that I mentioned before, so the, an ideal system must be fast, simple, and must make uh, penalties, direct penalties to the, to the damage and to the infragments, but not only to the individuals, also to the businesses, and must be deterministic. So in the same case, uh, or a similar case must have the, 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 the same output. So, in my opinion, that, that's the best, the best tool. Please, please, Javier. Yeah, if I may try to, to answer that complicated question, I would suggest only that the role of law is to try to ease to every citizen the right to claim uh, on behalf of the rights. Well, that, in theory, it's very easy, <laughs> in theory. But when it comes to the practical approach, it's not that easy. Because as we all know, well, things are moving very fast and we've got the paradigm of uh, human rights. That's the important thing. But the international system, it is uh, uh, based upon the idea of the sovereignty of states. And we do have still among us a lot of people who believe that sovereignty of states is a powerful tool even against the human rights of the people. So that's the paradigm that we have to, to overcome. And that's very important. And in particular, when it deals with the environment, because in theory also, well, we are all entitled to claim for the protection of the environment. But on the other side, there will be some people, some states, some political organizations that will suggest that we are not sovereign to do that because they are the ones entitled to claim on behalf of us. So I think there is a bridge in that idea, and it's a question of overcoming the troubles of sovereignty versus human rights. It is very difficult, and there are a lot of things uh, on the backside, of course, but that's my idea. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, it, it seems there is a, a divorce between we, human rights and business, and it should not be a divorce between these, these two topics. Okay? Uh, in the last year, uh, the European Parliament approved a directive on the 15th of April 2014 regarding sustainability report. In order to impose listed companies to include 
in the corporate governance report, these this kind of topics, how the companies uh, treat its, uh, their employees, how they uh, deal with the environmental issues, how they deal with the subsidiaries in, in other countries, not in the development world. So I think um, it seems it seems there is a divorce between business and human rights, but it's, we have all of us, uh, lawyers, practitioners, policymakers, try to, uh, does these two work, human rights and business, to go together. And I think a sustainability report is one of the, one of the weapons we have in order to, to, to go against this divorce. Okay? And many, many comp listed companies in, in the States are adopting this kind of uh, sustainability report in their corporate governance report. And probably in, in, in the coming years, it's going to be compulsory, not only to listed company, to all the companies, to include, to include in, in, in the report, uh, submit every year to the, to the registry, this kind of, of issues, the kind of, these kinds of matters that, in my, in my view, it should go in the same way, the same direction. I don't know if, yes, you, do you have any, any other issues, any other queries? Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Xavier, Jesus, Borja, and thank you very much, Governance, for the opportunity of being here with you and sharing our thoughts with you. And if you don't have any, you, okay, at three o'clock we will come back, okay? Thank you very much.